If we go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, Paul writes near the end of his life to his understudy Timothy, who's going to be taking over the ministry soon. Paul is, already has received a death sentence, and he knows that it's just a matter of days or weeks until he is called home. And listen to what he writes. This is a warning that goes through the ages, and we're going to be studying this. In fact, we're going into 2 Timothy in our study on going deeper. He says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents. Wow, that's a big one. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinence, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God. Boy, does that describe our society today. <laughs> Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So Paul is warning Timothy of the deteriorating state of mankind throughout this age. None of us should be surprised by what we see on the news, what we see when we go to Walmart, or what we see in our neighborhoods, because the Lord has warned us very clearly that throughout this age, as much as the gospel is going to be preached and souls are going to be saved, there's going to be a rise in the enemy's power and a manifestation of his lies and control in our society. One of the most powerful weapons Satan is unleashing today is called incontinence, or in some versions, the lack of self-control. This destructive trait in the character is unleashed when the carnal flesh takes complete control of the person's decision making, and it causes destructive havoc in one's life. And let me tell you something, here's the big warning. None of us are immune to this. In fact, Christians are called to recognize this and deal with this throughout all of our lives. This phenomenon has a destructive power, and just this one thing will unleash the hounds of hell in your life. Let me say that again. Just this one thing, if you lack, will release the hounds of hell in your life. There are Christians who have been consumed by this, who are not sitting here today because the hounds of hell have been released in their life in just this area. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Holy Spirit gives us a defense against these things, and that's called akretes, right? In the Greek, Paul uses the word here, it means to be powerless or impotent. And in its usage, it means lacking self-control, to be powerless, inclined to excesses. Inclined to excesses. It comes from, it's an adjective derived from two Greek words to mean without prevailing power is the second word. Properly used, it means to be incontinent, lacking self-control, self-discipline, or self-restraint. We all suffer from this. We all, in our lives, consistently manifest this ungodly fruit in our lives. It's just the way it is. So its derivatives you're going to see. This isn't the only... You know, what's interesting about the Greek is it's more detailed than English. And I believe that's why the Holy Spirit used Greek as a means to communicate gospel truths. So just like the word love in the English and the Greek, there's four or five different Greek words to describe types of love. Well, the word self-control, there are about five or six Greek words that describe specific aspects of self-control. We're going to look at about four of them today. Amen? So this is the first one. 
It's, it's more of in a negative sense of self-control. It's the negative consequences of self, lack of self-control. So here's my challenge to you here. And this is really all of us, what I'm about to go through. Now, remember this. This is not to condemn. I'm giving you this as a general example of the human flesh for different things that we all face. We're all guilty somewhere here, right? So we all qualify to, to receive this, amen? I know people, they know that they're alcoholics. They don't want to drink anymore, right? I know people who know they're drug addicts. They don't want to be drug addicts. I know people who feel guilty about one night stands, sexual immorality, adulterous affairs, and have seen, seen all kinds of them through my years. I know people who procrastinate and keep putting off their responsibilities, and it's a bad habit. I know people who struggle with pornography daily sometimes. I know people who struggle with gossip. Some people are sick of their angry outbursts. They're very angry people and they're quick to anger. Some people can't help but overspending when they're at the store and they're in constant debt all the time. People are aware they have bad eating habits, but they keep eating. A person knows they are playing a dangerous game with their bad driving habits and constant speeding. <coughs> <coughs> People, some people know, they, they steal and they know flat out it's wrong. Some people lie all the time and they know they're lying. They don't want to lie, but they lie. And some people are natural manipulators and scammers, knowing it's wrong, but they scam and they manipulate. Why? And here's the sad reality. All those, that, those are just examples, right? We read in 2 Timothy some of them. They all know what's wrong. They all don't want to do it. And yet they keep doing it over and over and over and over. Yeah. Why? Why do we keep doing these things over and over, knowing their destructive power in our, li in our lives? Why? And I'll tell you why. Ecrates, the lack of self-control is the one thing that trips us all up in these areas. We cannot seem to control these habitual urges. And when you're caught in these habitual urges, your flesh is running your life and it's manifesting these behaviors and it's destroying you. Self-destructive behaviors. We are addicted as a race of people to irrational, self-destructive behaviors, and we can't seem to stop. That is why there is jails filled with people, addiction places filled with addicts, people stealing, lying, cheating, scamming, wars, fighting, murders, rape, because we cannot control our fleshly, carnal urges in the sin nature. That is one reason I say the Bible is absolute truth. Because the Bible says we are all sinners. And we can't control our fleshly... And there's something dark in our flesh that leads us down the trail of destruction. We drift towards selfish desire, desires, neurotic behaviors, self-destructive behaviors. That's why we have millions of people in therapy. In essence, our flesh lives in a constantly irrational state of mind. Your sinful flesh nature, and don't you dare say you don't have it just because you're a Christian because I'm going to read scripture, <laughs> is irrational. And we all, put in the mirror right here, we all have it. And it, 
it, it, it claws at you. We're going to talk about temptations in a little while. The devil is constantly reinforcing this state in mankind. There are billions of demons around the planet whose job is to, is to, to work on people's flesh, to imprison them into addictions and sin patterns, to kill, to steal, and destroy. The enemy is making sure in this hour, like never before, that people are becoming slaves to their passion, to their desires, to their unrestrained lusts. So one way the enemy is doing it right now is subtly, in our society at least, in the Western world I'd say, he's moving the goalposts, so to speak, from the standards of the Word of God and to subjective human morality that is based on the sin nature. And our only defense against it is God's Word. Amen. The more people that lack self-control, the more evil the world becomes, and there is nothing to keep our sinful behaviors in check. It manifests so broadly these days, even in our business world, it's everywhere, it's in sports, and it's absolutely thoroughly throughout the entire political spectrum right now. Every single person up there lacks self-control in their lives. So, now let's get to the flip side. Let's talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Gospel. One of the fundamental effects that the Gospel should have is to help cultivate in our lives as believers self-governance, temperance, and self-control or self-mastery through the inward presence of the Holy Spirit and through God's Word. And thus we reverse this problem. Self-control should become a strong fruit in all of our lives. Now let's go to the Word of God, amen? Because I say nothing without the backing of the Word, not one word. Amen? Galatians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, you can go here. <clears throat> if you can't see the screen, Galatians chapter 5 and 16. But I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things of these, of which I what? Forewarn you. I what? Forewarn you. These who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, say it with me, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which things which there is no law. Now here's the key, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, what? Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Saint, I want to tell you something. You're in a private war in your everyday life. Sean can't fight my war. Mary can't fight Sean's war. Right? Tara can't fight Carlene's war. Charlotte can't fight Billy's war. They can pray. They can encourage. They can be examples. But ultimately, you must fight this war. It's you, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God versus your flesh. You must take the Word of God and you must use it to crucify your flesh. Amen. I call it the private war of the saint. We're all in it. Amen? 
In this instance, Paul uses the word enkratia. It is from two Greek words, in the sphere of, and kratos means dominion or mastery. So properly, dominion within, self-control proceeding out from within oneself, but not by oneself. This is a spiritual concept. This is the positive side of self-control that comes from spirit-led living. <clears throat> this type of self-control can only be manifested through the power of the Holy Spirit within you who absolutely empowers the Word of God to lead you. They work together. Amen? 2 Peter 1, chapter 6, Peter talks about the same thing. Make every effort to add your faith, goodness, right? And he gets down to, to a bunch of character qualities. He gets to self-control. Angratia. Self-mastery through the power of the Holy Ghost. How many of you know we need the Holy Ghost? Right? So, all believers have this inward power and ability through spiritual union as part of the new covenant. It is available, but God will not force it on you. Each one of us must take the necessary action on the manward side, right? To realize the effects. So the private war of the same, what Paul says here is our part, right? Here's our responsibility. We must walk by the Spirit. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? It means allow the Holy Spirit to dictate each moment of your life as you submit to the Holy Spirit, and He empowers you to overcome. Doesn't mean it's easy. Amen? Amen. One of the things the Holy Spirit will do is called conviction. He'll give you a little prick in your spirit and say, that's not good for you. That's not good for you, Rhonda. We all sense it. Who, who has sensed it before? That's the Holy Spirit in your, in your consciousness. And so what you must then do is recognize what's happening and then you must mortify your fleshly desires. That means you must rob them of their power by focusing on God's Word, by, allow, by walking by the Spirit. And He will give you the power to resist. I was an alcoholic. Why am I not now? The Holy Spirit. Self-control. Right? Very simple. Most sinful behaviors are prevented simply by exercising spirit-enabled self-control. People should see this on you in the world. They should say you're different. <laughs> they should see the fruit of self-control in your life when you're out in the world. Amen? But that's not the only means of self-control. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit in you, walking by the Spirit, is the primary way, but not the only way. There is instructionally based mastery of the self. We're going to take a look at this. Paul instructs Timothy very clearly on this matter, that self-control is also able to be learned by believers cognitively through both doctrinal instruction and behavior modeling. Paul gives very clear and specific instruction to each group of believers. So watch what he does here. He's going to address older men, younger men, older women, younger women, and then workers. And watch to the depth when we look at this, that Paul reinforces this concept and the effects of self-control, how they have it all across the culture in the church. Now go with me to the book of Titus, chapter 2. <clears throat> the book of Titus, 
Chapter 2, we're going to camp here for a few minutes. Sean Miller is going to love this part. But as for you, proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Amen. The job of the minister is what? Proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. That one's for free. Here's the, instru here's the sound doctrinal instruction on this matter. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, and self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love, and in perseverance. You older gentlemen, you should be examples to the rest of the church in your public life. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't mean to offend, and that does not particularly anybody here. You can ask my daughter. She'll, she'll testify to this. She works at Walmart full time, right? You know who some of the most rude, nasty people are? The older folks. Our society is so bad right now, I'm seeing two things that, are, that scare me. Number one is hyper-aggressive women, young women, mm -hmm. who literally want to scrap with you if something doesn't go their way. Like they are swinging on people, not just one in their mouth. It's scary. Secondly, I'm seeing older people who act worse than spoiled children in public. No self-control. No tempers. They're nasty. She comes home with horror stories. And I'm like, what is going on? People cussing at her. 70-year-old woman cussing at her. Slapped her. Because she wouldn't give her the pole to reach the, the, the uh, stuff on the higher shelf. Pushed her. 70-year-old woman. Who does that? And you wonder why the young people are out of control these days. Who do they have as examples? God is not having it right now. It's wake up time. I have bad news for you. Your voting and politics aren't going to fix this. We need the word of God in our society back. We need older people rising up and say, I will, no matter whether any one person believes me or not, I am going to walk godly. And it starts there. Now we get to the older women. Likewise, and the same instruction as men, they are to be what? Reverent in their behavior. Reverent in their behavior. There's nothing more cringy than an older woman having a meltdown in a store because she didn't have her way. Yes. Yelling and screaming and cussing people out. That is a sign that we're in big, big trouble. We are in deep, deep water right now. And why? Because Satan has pushed out the Word of God He's destroyed two or three generations now to the point where older people are now ungodly. And there's nobody left to model this but the people sitting in this church today. And anyone else out there that are sound churches. Ben's not here, sorry. You're going to have to teach him. No, uh, Ben is a fantastic young man with a good future. It's good to see. It's refreshing to see a young man being godly young in his life. Let me tell you something. It's an encouragement to me. You older women, reverend your behavior, not slanders. I remember a friend of mine who helps out in churches. He's a traveling teacher. A pastor called him up, a friend of his. He says, I got this problem in, this, in the church. He began to describe some of the situation, not being rude, this is not misogynistic, 
But my friend who is a very strong minister of the word said, you have a middle-aged woman leading a prayer group is gossiping and slandering you. How did you know that? You've got to be careful on what you say. This woman was subtly eroding the foundation of the respect in the pastor in the church by bad-mouthing him, and none of it was true. Leading a prayer group. Satan is very crafty how he gets in a church. She was slandering. Older woman, <coughs> Christian, leading a prayer group. Do not make, make, have no confidence in the flesh. This is why I don't. Slaves to much wine. <clears throat> Older women teach what is good. To train what? Who? <coughs> the young women to love their husbands and their children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, Submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. That the word of God not be reviled because your neighbors, your unsaved family members, your friends, your co workers are watching. Yes. This is God's word, not my opinion. I haven't said one thing of Eric right here. We go on. Likewise, now let's go to the younger men. Right? Urge the younger men to be what? Mm, interesting. We on to something here today. Show yourself, this is Timothy now, as a minister, in all respects to what? A model of good works. A model of good works. You see, there is modeling. There is modeling of behavior. If, if, if I'm out of order as the minister, right? Who's going to follow me? No one's going to respect me. If I'm out there blaspheming or slandering or whatnot, acting like a fool, And in your what? Teaching. Show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. And then goes into bond servants. If you take it in today's language, the worker boss relationship. Submissive to their own masters and everything. They're well pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, showing all in good faith, so that in everything they may what? Adorn the doctrine of God. What's the doctrine of God here? In this specific case, walking in the Spirit, showing self control and godliness publicly. That is the doctrine of God in context here. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live what? Self-control, upright, and godly lives in the present age. People want to preach the grace. You see, grace, grace, grace. There's a whole movement on it in the church right now. They're not preaching this part of it. The grace of God trains you. It gives you the ability to live upright, self-controlled, and godly lives, not in your future, right now. In the midst of everything going on around you, you must stand firm and persevere in this area. Waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing and glory of our great God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to what? Purify for himself the people. We are being purified. That is a process. Are you zealous for good works? And I'm not just talking feeding the poor, going to a homeless shelter, building a well. Are you zealous for good works in your daily lives? Not just one month out of the year, not just on Sundays. Are you zealous? Is, is something in you drive you to say, when I go to Walmart, I'm not going to act like anybody else. Let's start with the basics. I'm going to resist having an argument with my spouse. I'm going to say something nice instead of something negative. The basics. Start there, because that's where God is. You can't be a Christian two days out of the week. It has to be a lifestyle. And I'm preaching at myself, just to make sure you know self. Here Paul uses another Greek word called sophron. It means to be of sound mind, self-controlled and temperate, sober-minded, modest, and chaste. The focus of this objective is to stress the overall holistic balance that it brings in the quality of our spiritual life. It is an inner outlook referring to what is prudent because it's correctly balanced. So this is all about balance. This sophron brings with you a healthy, balanced Christian lifestyle. Not too little here, not too much there, right in balance. Not legalistic, not licentious, right in the middle. Moderation. 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 What's moderation? Not too much. Not too little. Just enough. And it's also tempered by wisdom. Amen? Wisdom plays a big part of this. That's why you see these things all strung together. Wisdom, knowledge, all these things are part of one big whole. This is God-defined balance. In 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul writes, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of what? Power. Let's go to the next slide. Power, love, and what? Self-control. Self Srothnomosis. This now takes that concept, that balance, that moderation, and it is a form of wisdom, right, that helps you to moderate your behavior in a specific situation. It, it gives you the ability to act out God's will by using what he calls sound reasoning. One of the things that I get really annoyed by the Pentecostal charismatic part of the church is all reasoning goes out the window and they actually will preach against it. Well, you, you can't use your mind when knowing God. It is all about the mind and godly reasoning and logic and wisdom and knowledge. This, the Bible emphasizes over and over and over. Almost done. Related biblical terms. Temperance. Sober-mindedness. Reverence. Dignified behavior. Uprightness. Mastery. The fear of the Lord. Wisdom. Purity. Godliness. Integrity. Soundness. We got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Preaching at myself. Few scriptures supporting scriptures. First Corinthians 
9 and 24. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises what? Self-control. You ever see a professional athlete? You do not get to the professional level, whether it's football, baseball, hockey, soccer, without a completely regimented and disciplined lifestyle. They can't skip training because there's a guy behind you looking for your spot and he's working hard and he'll outwork you or her and they'll get your spot. They are driven to be the best. And that's what Paul likens our race to in the faith. They don't receive a perishable, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, Paul writes. I don't box as if I'm beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. In other words, I'll be a hypocrite. And no one's going to respect them. <clears throat> Proverbs 16.32 Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 25.28 A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. The enemy will come in and plunder. James 1 and 19. Know this. And when James says know this, what does that mean? Know this. <laughs> My beloved brothers, especially for anyone who sits in row 6, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Wow. I challenge it with that one. I challenge myself. We love to get our opinion across. James tells us it is better to listen, process that person's perspective. We could use a lot of this these days. And don't get so offended and angry. Listen. Process. Control yourself. Formulate a response in wisdom. Then say something. We should be listening a lot more than speaking. For the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, and when we see therefore, but therefore, put away. Put away what? Filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Powerful. The word is continuously and progressively transforming our souls into the image of Christ. And there should be less and less and less flesh and more and more and more fruit of the Spirit. It's not rocket science. In closing, Scripture is very extensive in its warning against the lack of self-control and self-mastery. In fact, the Bible uses many words to describe this fundamental issue. Listen to me very carefully again. This one issue, if you don't get reasonable mastery over it, and you master your own life, and you govern yourselves through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, the devil will get in, and he's going to cause you to fall away. Because when he gets a hold of you, and your flesh starts running your life in whatever area it is, 
I have bad news for you. And it's very bad news. You are becoming a prisoner of the enemy. And you are missing out on God's best for your life. It is not God's will that any believer be in bondage to anything of the flesh. It is not God's will, not 1% of it, Now I'm going to get real talk here in closing. There are people, believers, and I know that I've tragically been at the funerals that die premature deaths because of one thing in their life. It literally can kill you. That's the facts. Let's just get this, let's talk real here. We're not going to fluff religion today. You have got to control and master in moderation every area of your life. How many know you can eat yourself to an early grave? It's just the way it is. You can drink yourself to an early grave. You can anxiety yourself to crippling forms of things. And I'm not talking the type of anxiety where you have a, a bodily problem that causes it. I mean worry, fear, anxiousness. I have a family member who is literally crippled in a wheelchair because of it. Because of 50 years of releasing chemicals in her body of anxiety and fear and phobias that ate away their joints. It's a physical fact. There are Christians who are separated from their spouses and divorced because they can't stop, them. one of them or two of them can't stop the anger. The anger starts going, and it goes, and it goes, and it kills the marriage. I know Christians, I minister to them, who have gotten sexually transmitted disease because they can't stop fornicating. And I had to go to this person and in love warn them. The Lord's been warning you and warning you and warning you. You will miss God's best for your life. Miriam and I were talking this week and I was trying to encourage her as best as you can encourage your kids in this day and age. You have control over how far you want to go to the Lord in your life. You can have 100% of God's will for your life. That's what He wants, but He's not going to force it on you. You can have 75% of God's will. You're still going to heaven. You still have eternal life. You'll get rewards. You can get 20% of God's will for your life. And you'll go to heaven. And you'll get rewards. But not as much. I got an amen in the back row. <laughs> That's so beautiful. It's up to each one of you. And this is one area that you must get master over to get there. Amen? Amen? We have to be aware of this most fundamental issue and continually throughout our lives learn to recognize and, and the pull of our fleshly urges, respond accordingly through the proper application of spirit-initiated self-control. Ignoring this or not properly mastering Self-control will cause devastating consequences spiritually, emotionally, financially, socially, and physically. Debt, overspending, so many ways that it happens, it's scary. It's actually scary how just one thing can cripple you. Would you pray with me?
Lord, we humbly come before you, Lord, and acknowledge we can't do it in our own flesh. Lord, we need you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come into each and every person right now in their minds. And Lord, just show us areas in our lives where we need self-mastery. Lord, let us not resist the conviction of the Holy Ghost right now, but let us submit ourselves to the Lord and humbly admit our needs. I pray that each and every person hearing this message will not feel condemnation, but will feel a draw and an urgency in their lives to walk in self-mastery and temperance and self-governance and moderation and self-control. Help us to control things over our lives that are harming us right now and help us to conform to the image of your Son. Lord, I ask for a zeal to be birthed in all of our hearts this morning in this area. Let it be a passionate pursuit Lord, and most of all, I ask that, the, that this body and all those listening place a flame in our hearts to seek 100% of your will for us, whatever that may be in each one of our lives. Holy Spirit, bless and teach. Jesus, give us a revelation of your love for us. And your desire and your of your, your goodness for our lives. Let us grow up and mature and grow and be conformed to the image of your Son. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know the, the Holy Spirit is probably speaking right now things in our hearts. The enemy would like to make you embarrassed or condemned, or the enemy would like to, he's probably speaking to some of us right now, nah, don't listen to this. Lord, I, I pray that your word would stand clearer than the voice of the enemy. Let us recognize that voice and take every thought captive and bring it under the obedience of your word. Holy Spirit, conform us to the image of your Son. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, if you're struggling in an area, please seek counsel. Call me, message me. This is a church where it's okay to fail sometimes. You are not condemned because you failed. That's what the enemy would want you to believe. But if you are struggling in an area of your life, please reach out. Humble yourselves. Because sometimes, as Titus said, we can't just do it on our own. We need help. Sometimes we need to talk to another brother or sister in Christ. The book of James writes, it, writes this, and I know I'm spoiling our James, but we're going to get back to it. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. The way that in context that he used hamatera there means your faults, your struggles. This is not a confession of sin where you're seeking forgiveness per se. It is humbling yourself and being accountable to the body of believers. Pride's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Pride's going to tell you to keep your mouth shut. You can do it on your own. Lord, break that pride in us. We all have it. I thank you, Lord, so much for this body. Continue to pray for the sick, Continue to pray for Pastor Brian, for all those who are struggling with illnesses and cancer and things that are going on in many lives right now. Most of all, 
Jesus, I ask that your presence would be strong in this church, that would continue the lineage of being a godly, scripture-centered church who loves the Lord Jesus Christ all the way through the very foundations of this church. That your presence would be amongst this group of believers. Lord, that your will would be done in this neighborhood, in this town, and in any way that you can use us. I pray for those who are listening online right now who join us in through teams, that you continue to grant them wisdom and encouragement. And I thank you for their love and support. And we pray, Lord, as we go into this week, that you would be with us and guide us and help us to hear your voice more and more. Help us to study your word more and more. Help us to pick up the phone and encourage one another more and more. Bond our hearts together in unity and love. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. And the church would say, Amen.